Well, good afternoon. Today is Saturday, April 25th, 2015. I want to thank you for joining us at North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams, here for another action-packed episode. And I am going to stress there is action after a little bit of drama uh, that we're going to bring you today. Uh, first, a reminder. Uh, well, first of all, I want to say thank you to our young intern, uh, Andrew. He's back in the control, control room with us uh, today for the first time in a couple of weeks. I, I'm still wondering why he wasn't here, but then I'm not paying him, so that means that I guess he's free to do freelance work and, and all that. Although I do have a really sneaking suspicion that what he was really up to was working with an IT person and designing a special app and how to figure out what he's going to get in 243 days since that's the number of shopping days that are left until Christmas. So I figured that if he's designing an app, he's probably working on one-on-one -on -one communications with Santa right now. And I think that, you know, everybody ought to be as innovative as that, uh, as, as that particular um, individual is. Uh, so... You know, with uh, today being Saturday, uh, let's uh, take a look at a couple of things that happened um, a couple of weeks ago. Hillary Clinton made a major announcement. It was the worst kept secret in all of Washington because I think that everybody pretty much knew the announcement that she was going to make that she was going to and is planning and wants to be President of the United States. That is not a surprise. Uh, so what we're going to do right now is uh, show you, and I guess I'm going to preface this, that what we're going to be doing here in the next few weeks in, w in one segment, unless there's pressing news that's, that takes immediate uh, attention, is we're going to focus as these candidates announce for president and from both parties, uh, including any major independent candidate that might uh, jump in, maybe you know Donald Trump if he decides to not run any party but decides he wants to run, well, we'll cover him too. But we're going to just focus on the announcement uh, as each of these people announce. Now, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to end up just taking one at a time. So we're going to kind of try to get through that backlog. So right now we're going to show you Hillary Clinton's announcement. I'm getting ready for a lot of things. <laughs> a lot of things. It's spring, so we're starting to get the gardens ready, and my tomatoes are legendary here in my own neighborhood. <laughs> my daughter is about to start kindergarten next year, and so we're moving yeah. just so she can belong to a better school. Mi hermana y yo estamos empezando un primer negocio. Vaya. <laughs> After five years of raising my children, I am now going back to work. Every day we're trying to get more and more ready and more prepared. The baby boy, coming your way. <laughs> right now I'm applying for jobs. It's a look into what the real world will look like after college. I'm getting married this summer to someone I really care about. I'm gonna be in the play and I'm gonna be in a fish costume. For little tiny fishes. I'm getting ready to retire soon. <laughs> Retirement means reinventing yourself in many ways. Well, we've been doing a lot of home renovations. But most importantly, we really just want to teach our dog to quit eating the trash. <laughs> and so we have high hopes for 2015 that that's going to happen. <laughs> I've started a new career recently. This is a fifth generation company, which means a, a, a lot to me. This country was founded on hard work, and it really feels good to be a part of that. I'm getting ready to do something, too. I'm running for president. Americans have fought their way back from tough economic times, but the deck is still stacked in favor of those at the top. Everyday Americans need a champion, and I want to be that champion. So you can do more than just get by. You can get ahead and stay ahead, because when families are strong, America is strong. <laughs> so I'm hitting the road to earn your vote, because it's your time and I hope you'll join me on this journey. Hillary's 
Chinese uh, logo. It reminds me of the Amtrak uh, pointless arrow is what they had called that logo and exactly what message that Hillary was going to show with that particular logo. Other than it's pointing to the right, uh, I have absolute, that, that speaks nothing to me. And this comes from somebody who has had some background in uh, layout and design of newspapers, design logos myself. Uh, really, exactly what she was planning with that logo, I don't know. But the one thing is, you know, Hillary keeps talking about how much she's fighting and how people are struggling. She was Secretary of State under President Obama's administration. Do you think that maybe a Secretary of State that she would have had his ear on economic matters? I'll tell you one other thing, one, one big reason why, and I've said, I've said it before, so it, it's not going to come as any, shouldn't come as any surprise. I am not a Hillary Clinton supporter. And I will say, for the record, I am not a Jeb Bush supporter either. I think that we have had enough of a dynastic two-family rule. So that being said, here's one of the biggest problems I have with Hillary Clinton's nomination is the fact that you go back to one of the key things that happened during Bill Clinton's administration, and that was the 1995 regulatory changes to the Community Reinvestment Act. Now, the intention was good. The Community Reinvestment Act came out in 1977, signed by Jimmy Carter, and was supposed to end redlining of mortgages in uh, inner city uh, communities, uh, try to you know get more people in the urban core to own houses, stop a, pra a regulatory practice that really was not that good. And as a matter of fact, the redlining in, in mortgages uh, really had a major impact on the way the city of Detroit has uh, been over the last number of decades, including the 1967 uh, riots that occurred in Detroit. So 1977, the practice of redlining in uh, minority area, uh, minority districts, that was supposed to end. Uh, this was supposed to open up the door to allow minority home ownership. And you know what? That is a wonderful thing. But by 1995, what had happened? We had just gone through a uh, period of bank consolidations, and we had credit scoring. And then we end up having the 1995 regulatory change to the Community Reinvestment Act. And what that did was allowed for groups like ACORN and, uh, and a few others that in their name is supposed to be benevolent and help people. But what they were really doing was writing phony mortgages. They were writing mortgages for people who they knew would not qualify for a conventional loan. They knew would not have the wherewithal to pay for conventional loans. They also were writing up uh, mortgage. Uh, they served essentially, what they did was two things. One, they pressured the mortgage companies to uh, you know, to force the Community Reinvestment Act's enforcement. And there was a, a scoring mechanism. I'm trying to take a complicated thing and, and, and break it down for you. Uh, so they forced the Wall Street bankers to and, and mortgage companies to have positive community reinvestment scores. Then they offered to, under, uh, to serve as the underwriters on behalf of these companies. And then from there, they went through to the neighborhoods and then they were doing signature loans for people who wouldn't qualify. And then you had, 19, uh, then you had a four, it was 8.2% um, default rate of these loans in the late 90s, around 99 or 2000. So you already had an 8.2% of these. The national average was 1.9%, so four times greater default rate. And they kept writing more and more and more of them. And then in Wall Street, they started packaging what they were told by groups like Acorn that this is going to be a good thing and they were all good mortgages. And that's when you started getting your complicated uh, mortgage holdings and, and packaging and tranches and a whole bunch of complicated stuff that ultimately by 2008, uh, going back to 04, 05, 06, when we had a high period of uh, mortgage foreclosures. They were the first to go. They were called subprime. And then after that, we had huge debt on Wall Street from mortgage-backed securities. And look what's happening even today. We're still sitting here with stagnant growth in the economy. And really, it goes back to Hillary Clinton's husband 
as President of the United States, 19 years ago, actually 20 years ago, it was 1995, 20 years ago, they're the ones who opened this up. So if 20 years ago we're still, something happened and we're still feeling the effects of that today, why would I want another Clinton in the office? Now, I will also have to mention this, and we're going to show you our next video clip real, uh, real quick here, is how does Saturday Night Live spin this? Hillary Clinton announcement. Saturday Night Live skit featuring Kate McKinnon as Hillary announcing her second run for the White House on social media. Check this out. Want to do some vocal warm-ups and then we'll get started? Ooh, okay, I'd love to. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Hillary's a granny with a twinkle in her eye. <laughs> Hillary's a granny and she makes an apple pie. First female president. First female president. Me, 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 me. <laughs> hey, great, Mrs. Clinton. Okay, now hold up your phone mm -hmm. and you can mm -hmm. just look natural, okay? okay? okay. okay. <laughs> Citizens, you will elect me. I will be your leader. Okay. Don't worry, okay. we'll just delete that one off your phone. Okay. <laughs> Know a thing or two about that, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Christina, meet my hand in the okay. air. Thank you so much. Hillary would make a great president. Thank you. And I would make an even greater first dude. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. That's nice. Hillary, isn't it crazy that phones can take videos now? Yeah. I mean, if they could have done that in the 90s, <laughs> I'd be in jail. <laughs> Yeah. Daryl Hammond, of course, says Bill Clinton. I'll tell you, that's going to be, I can't say enough about that. And next. We're so that was uh, Saturday Night Live spin on the Hillary Clinton announcement. Um, man, yes, there's, you know, Bill Clinton, you know, he was convorting while in the White House. For those of you who are millennials who don't remember the Clinton years and always hear just the positive spin, uh, you know, Bill Clinton has uh, converted in the White House the first time. Do you really want him there again for those of you who are baby boomers or uh, Gen Xers like myself? Bill Clinton converting again in the White House? Which intern is he going to find this time? I hope we never have to find that answer out. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we brought you a story about uh, Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus announcing that they are not going to be using elephants in their performances again after 2018. So we're going to just show you the first uh, few sec uh, first minute or two of uh, one of one of the uh, major announcements that came out about that particular story before we continue with the rest of our show. Turn of the last century, the late 1800s, P.T. Barnum has been known for spectacle, big top shows, and elephants. But the animal's treatment, often criticized as cruel, has been the subject of ever-widening lawsuits and scrutiny. Today, Ringley Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey Circus bowed out of the fight, announcing that by 2018, all elephant performances will end. Ringling's parent company owns 43 of the pachyderms, 13 still touring and performing in a thousand shows a year. The Humane Society is one, was one of the animal rights groups pressuring the company. Its president, president Wayne Pacelli, joins me now. Mr. Pacelli, many of us have been to the circus and we don't necessarily see what the problem is. What was the problem? Well, there's what happens in the three rings, but really the big story and the back story is what happens to animals during training where they're coercively trained, they're dominated, sometimes hit with bull hooks, which is like a broom handle with a sharp uh, metal object at the end of it. They're often on chains for 20 or 22 hours a day, and they're really uh, sent on boxcars on railroads to 100, 115 cities a year. So they're going from Detroit to Milwaukee to Minneapolis. That's no life for an elephant. These are highly intelligent, sociable animals uh, in the wild, they migrate 40 miles a day. They live with the mothers and the grandmothers and the babies. You know, life on a chain to do a silly stunt, I think a lot of people question in 2015 whether that is an appropriate activity. Well, elephants, they do have very thick skins. You know, they're not soft skin like we humans are. 
And if they already travel 40 miles, or I've heard in some instances 80 miles, if elephants can travel this distance, then why do they have a problem going from Detroit to Chicago to Milwaukee to Minneapolis? That part of his logic I, I really don't understand. I know what he's trying to get at. He's trying to say that having an elephant in captivity is a really, really bad thing. We shouldn't do it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but here's what happens when you have um, hunters out in the wild. As, as we had mentioned in our show pri uh, prior, you know, what is the alternative? The alternative is to have poaching, to put them in areas where we have poachers. And then let's take a look at something that just happened last week with a big game hunter. His name is Ian Gibson, uh, and his death has elicited zero sympathy, including from myself. I'm just going to read a couple of comments here before I play the video. Um, well, actually, I've got to play the video first, so that way you know what the context is here. Sorry about that. And let's uh, go to the video on my computer, please. They are the largest land mammal, and so it's fitting that a special breakfast treat for the elephants at Sydney's Taronga Zoo was a record-breaking 728-kilogram pumpkin. The monster vegetable was the largest to ever grace Sydney's royal show, and was trucked to the zoo after it received its prize, to be stomped on and gobbled up by the local pachyderms. They approached it fairly quickly, actually, and, uh, and then when they got near it, they were a little cautious, making sure things were okay. And then one of the big girls, Pac Boone, kind of led the charge. She got her head down, smashed the pumpkin fairly quickly actually and uh, now they've demolished it. The zoo's elephants get a variety of interesting food items, particularly enjoying fibrous palm logs and tough pineapple plant tops. But the keepers said when they saw the giant pumpkin, they couldn't resist trying to get it. Enrichment's important for every kind of animal, uh, us included. So for elephants, they're an intelligent creature and we want to provide them with as much enrichment as they can too, you know. So they really enjoy things that change from the day to day. So we try to surprise them with different toys. We surprise them with different foods, like massive pumpkins. They loved it, yeah. From, you have a look for yourself. They've uh, demolished it and still eating it, so I'm sure they liked it. The pumpkin would normally be recycled as green waste after the show, but organisers said they were happy to serve it up to some mammoth diners instead. Well, that was not exactly the video that we had intended to show you, but hey, there's a big honking pumpkin that's out there, and there are elephants that like pumpkin. Well, guess what? we got farmers in Minnesota, and if you go to the Minnesota State Fair, Coming up in August and September, if you go to the Minnesota State Fair, go into one of those agriculture buildings, and what do you see? 900-pound pumpkins. Well, at least we now know that there's a market for them. In the meantime, uh, as we had thought that we were going to have uh, a video about Ian Gibson, he's a big game hunter, well, what ended up happening is he was trampled to death while hunting an elephant. And just read a couple of quotes. Um, uh, that were on the Huffington Post store, uh, website that you had just seen uh, with that video um, from one person named Aaron M. My deepest condolences to the family of the elephant to be approached and almost killed by such a horrible animal. Non-sarcastically, it couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. I hope he was absolutely terrified in his last seconds. Uh, Andrew Taggart. By experienced, I suppose they mean complacent. Or maybe they mean he slaughtered lots of other amazing animals. Good news for all the animals this man would have carried on murdering. And they say he was the best. The elephant was better. And then David Jenkins, I have zero sympathy for this hunter. I react to this, ver the, this the very same way I do when I see a bullfighter get mangled. Bravo. Condolences to his family, of course, but I'm more con far more concerned about the status of the elephant that delivered his much-deserved karmic payback. As to the subhuman and disgusting woman hunter who posed with such glee with a draft she'd kill, look up the word karma and put your weapons down and wipe that smile off your blood-spattered face. Uh, and then uh, Nicola Gill, and I have no idea about uh, the situation with the giraffe. Um, Nicola Gill, elephant one, hunter zero, elephant wins. So that's what happened, you know, people are cheering on elephants, right? Absolutely, and they should. Elephants are very, very smart creatures, and as I mentioned, they do have very thick skins. So I think that they're not necessarily afraid of any type of criticism that might be coming their way, unlike a lot of animal rights activists. 
But now, what else in the world is happening with elephants? A story I actually read uh, recently in Air Force Times newspaper or magazine. Uh, there's actually a story coming out of South Africa, and we're going to just show you that video right now. Now, South Africa is definitely thinking outside of the box concerning security. In the South African bush, elephants are being trained in the art of biodetection to see if they can use their exceptional sense of smell to sniff out explosives, landmines, and even poachers. During a recent test run, a 17-year-old male elephant named Tishuru walked past a row of buckets. A swab laced with TNT scent had been stapled to the bottom of one. Now sticking his trunk into each bucket, Tishuru stopped and raised a front leg when he came across the one with a swab and he also got the buckets right each time. We're doing a lot of research on the elephant smelling abilities. So one of the things that we've been doing is the tracking, seeing how well an elephant can follow a human scent through the bush or indeed something like a rhino or a lion. And then uh, we're also working on the scenting ability in terms of finding things like explosives and uh, that sort of stuff, drugs and that sort of stuff. So we're looking at those sort of projects in real detail at the moment. Well, let's take a look at uh, what happened back in 218 B.C. This is actually not the first time that elephants are being used for military service. Uh, 218 B.C. So let's see, it's 2015 now. Uh, 2,233 years ago. That was how long Hannibal crossed the Alps in the Second Punic War. Uh, it was Rome versus Carthage. They had already finished their first Punic War, and Hannibal was in Spain, and he was trying to figure out how to get at the, uh, on behalf of uh, the Carthaginian army, he wanted to get over to Rome. And what's the best way of doing that? You would think to take a more coastal pattern, but instead he decided to do something completely unthinkable. He took a herd of North African elephants, not Asian elephants that are often depicted in some of the uh, historical etchings and photographs, but no, this is a North African elephant, uh, 37 or 38 of them, and he marched them through the Alps and then came out of the crossing in the Alps and ended up fighting a battle against the Roman army. So let's take a look at the first video we have on this segment because we want you to see the historical context behind the uses of elephants. And we talk about the circus. Circus, and we can't have elephants intermingling with human beings. Well, elephants, we can't have them in military service. I'm surprised that that, that objection hasn't come out yet, but I figure it's just a matter of time. But now let's take a look back at 218 B.C. We do not have video coverage from that particular uh, event, but we do want to make sure that you have the very best in a historical recreation. Imagine trying to move 37 elephants more than a thousand miles across some of the most treacherous terrain known to man without the use of any modern day mega mover tools. In 218 BC, Hannibal set out to do just that, and it would become one of the greatest and most daring mega moves of the ancient world. His army was massive. It's thought to have been as many as 90,000 men. 20 to 30,000 cavalry plus his elephants. Author John Kistler has spent his life studying and working with elephants. The war elephant could be compared in modern terms to a light tank from World War II or a World War II American half track. The reason being that the vehicle itself is only partially a weapon. More, it is a mobile platform. That's why, in the ancient world, elephants were useful in so many ways. Whatever enemy you came across, you could just put the weapon you needed on top. Or if you just needed observation towers, you could stick your generals and your commanders up there so they have a better view of the battlefield. Hannibal's goal, use these beasts to conquer Rome. The elephant was a perfect weapon in the ancient world, mainly because most people didn't know what it was. People who saw an elephant for the first time, including armies, would just flee. 
but moving them would pose some unprecedented challenges. One, the hostile terrain could be a killer. Two, the untested techniques would push them to extremes. The logistics of taking a huge army of this sort is immense. Talk about a mega mover. The plan. The elephants would be led on foot across the arid Spanish plain. At the Rhone River, rafts would be built, creating a floating bridge so the elephants could be transported across. Finally, they would ascend the 10,000-foot passes of the Italian Alps. There's a number of difficulties, obviously, in transporting these elephants this long range by leaving in the spring to hopefully arrive in the Alps before the winter. Any little delays could prevent them from reaching the Alps in the fall. And if they waited until winter, they would never get over them. New Carthage, Spain, 218 BC. Hannibal set out on the first leg of his grueling three-part move to reach Italy, hauling his elephants across 650 miles of harsh desert and plains. The land route was the only way to get this huge army across. Hannibal assigned a team of megamovers to each elephant. It is likely that there were probably four people per elephant, one rider and three other people who assisted. The lead megamover, the rider, was known as the mahout. The mahout is the most important part of any elephant. Without the mahout, the elephant doesn't know what is wanted from it. And so the mahout is basically like a translator. He takes the orders of the general and tells the elephant what to do and how to do it. The life of the mahout is very dangerous because usually it's male elephants that are used for the military. They tend to be more aggressive. And the problem is, is that male elephants, as much as once or twice a year, basically go berserk. It's thought to be part of the breeding process, and they want to fight with anything they see. Risking their lives, the Mahouts led these mammoth beasts across Spain, averaging about six miles a day. It was critical they reach the Alps and cross them before winter, which was rapidly approaching. So they had to devise ingenious ways for keeping the elephants moving. Elephants don't just stand there and eat three meals at three different times of the day like humans do. They eat almost all day and all night. So I believe that they had carts pulled in front of the elephants so that the elephants could just reach out with their trunks and grab a mouthful of food while they're marching along. This trek, which lasted nearly four months, was an important time for the Mahouts to bond with their elephant and develop a deep sense of trust, because it was here, on the banks of the Rhone River, where their skills were really put to the test. It's believed that the river would have been at least 300 feet wide, and since elephants can't see very well, they wouldn't even be able to see across to see the other side. So when they approached the Rhone River, they got very upset and didn't want to go in. If Hannibal stood any chance of conquering Rome, it was critical that he come up with a plan for moving these elephants across the Rhone River. So he took a page from Roman megamovers. Hannibal stole a Roman trick from the First Punic War. One of the Roman generals in Sicily built rafts using hundreds of airtight containers, basically giant wine or water kegs. He then laid out boards on top of the containers and put dirt and plants on them so it looked like ground. And they got the elephants out onto the fake ground. And so this is where Hannibal got his idea for building rafts and tricking the elephants to get on to the raft. Hannibal's mega movers floated close to 50 tons of pachyderms into the mighty Rhone River. Unfortunately, Hannibal didn't take into account the herding instincts of his elephants. The First Punic War had occurred about 22 years before Hannibal had worked on crossing the Alps. And I did get some clarification that the species of North African elephant that Hannibal had used has long been extinct, and it was a smaller elephant than those that we currently know. So what exactly happened with crossing the river? Let's find out. He floated his elephants on rafts. This proved to be a disaster, not for the elephants, but for the megamovers. Elephants 
live in herds and like to follow. So when one elephant jumped off the raft, they all followed and all jumped in. And elephants swim very well. And they swam right across to the correct side of the river. The problem was that the riders on their backs, almost all of them drowned. This move was in jeopardy, with most of the elephant handlers now dead. Elephants form permanent, lifelong bonds with their riders, and so this would be like losing your husband or your wife. Hannibal quickly converted some of his young warriors into mega movers. It was a risky decision. The elephants had to become accustomed to new riders, which usually takes months. But that was not going to be possible since they now had to cross the Alps. They had to hurry because they were running a little late, and if they got stuck in the Alps during snow time, they would never get across. Hannibal's army pressed on. It took them two weeks to cross the Alps. Hannibal, although he's thought of as a genius for getting his army across the Alps, it was a Pyrrhic victory in every sense because he lost as many as 60% of his men. He lost 40,000 infantry, 10,000 cavalry. So even though it was sort of a success, it was a disastrous success. Amazingly, all the elephants survived the 1,000-mile trek, a success for these ancient megamovers. And shortly after crossing the Alps, Hannibal used the elephants with great effectiveness to win the Battle of Trevia. Well, unlike the Animal Humane Society that thinks that uh, you know, just working an elephant, working with an elephant, human contact with elephant is a bad thing, the elephants were more durable than people while crossing the Alps. I think the elephants will do just fine in the circus. But now what happened when Hannibal had finished with his Alps crossing? What happened? Well, let's find out. Almost as famous as Hannibal himself, are the elephants he used in battle. These were the Carthaginian's terror weapon. Small numbers of elephants could have a massive effect. It's not hard to imagine why. The sight of charging elephants would strike fear into any right-thinking person facing them. Elephants are mainly terror weapons. They scare the living daylights out of the enemy, make them run away. They're big, they're gray, they make strange noises, they're smelly, they frighten people. There's something that no one's ever seen before, particularly for a Roman. You've never seen an animal that's that sort of size, and you certainly haven't seen one bearing down on you in great numbers. So what it has to do is turn up and come charging towards you, and you're already pretty scared. You cannot imagine how fast an elephant can be if, you, if he goes wild. Uh, the most people, they think an elephant is very slow and because he's so big. He's like 40, 45 kilometers per hour. He can move very, very fast. So I think it's a very effective weapon in the war. The elephants used by the Carthaginians were a smaller, now extinct breed of African elephant from the foothills of North Africa's Atlas Mountains. The deployment of the battle elephant wasn't particularly subtle. Immediately before the battle, the elephants were first plied with wine. I can imagine he, he used some alcohol because elephants, they like alcohol, like beer or wine or something like this. They will, they will drink it. And it's like, the effect is like f for people, some people are very shy. So uh, they drink some alcohol and they're the biggest fighter in the world. And this isn't with an elephant. You can turn uh, the, the character with alcohol. The elephants would then be prodded in their ankles. In their inebriated state, this would have made them as mad as hell. Then it was simply a matter of pointing them at the enemy and charging and hanging on. The elephant is very big and very large, and it's just going to trample its way through any formation. So they're very formidable. They can break up particularly dense bodies of troops. And cavalry, they're just frightened by terrifying the horses. Hardly a weapon of surgical precision, the idea was that they would batter the enemy, breaking their lines. When an elephant attacks people, he will use his whole body. So, first of all, they will roll the trunk in. 
they get down with the head and they attack with the trunk and hit very hard. If they have tusk and use the tusk, you will maybe already be dead by a, by a hit from a tusk. And the feet, they, they go on and, and smash everything under the feet. They go like tomato juice. However, there was a fundamental flaw to this weapon system. They were inherently unpredictable. Well, I'm going to read you the uh, story on Huffington Post. I'm not going to try to show you a video that doesn't exist. A professional game hunter has been trampled to death by an elephant while leading a hunt with an American client in Zimbabwe. Ian Gibson, 55, was tracking animals in Chiwori North in the lower Zambezi, Zambezi Valley of Zimbabwe when the young bull elephant began a full charge. Paul Smith, the managing director of uh, Chifudi Safaris, which employed Gibson, said, uh, told the uh, UK Telegraph, we don't yet know the full details of how Gibbo, as, he, as we called him, died, as the American client and trackers are still too traumatized to give us full details. In a note on the website of Safari Classics, the company uh, explained Gibson had been searching for a target for five hours when they stopped to rest. It is with deep sadness to announce the passing of Chifudi Safari's professional hunter, Ian Gibson, the note said. Ian was tragically killed by an elephant bull earlier today while guiding an elephant hunt in Chiwori North. It adds, feeling he was quite close to the elephant, boy, I'd say, uh, Ian and his tracker, Robert, continued to follow the tracks in hopes of getting a look at the ivory as the client stayed with the game scout. Gibson's tracker indicated the elephant was in, a, in the must, a condition where the animal's urge to mate goes into overdrive and it becomes overly aggressive. But Gibson continued. The note continues, uh, they eventually caught up with the bull, spotting him at about 50 to 100 meters. The bull instantly turned and began a full charge. And if you remember the video we just played about how they get when, you know, it's something to do with breeding and they get very, very violent, this bull elephant in Zimbabwe was that way when Ian Gibson tried to approach. And the bull instantly turned and began a full charge. Ian and Robert began shouting in order to stop the charge. At very close range, Ian was able to get, one, get off one shot before the bull killed him. The scene was very graphic. It is not known if the animal was killed in the incident. Gibson is paid tribute to as a fine man and one of the most experienced professional hunters on the African continent. The same company lost a staff member in 2012 when Owain Lewis was killed by a buffalo, New Zimbabwe reports. So they're, they don't have, you know, they, they Elephants bond with people, except there's that certain time in, you know, in, in cats. Cats bond with people until they become feral. If you have a feral cat around, it's going to run. But this time, a feral elephant is going to do what? He's going to kill you. And there was Ian Gibson out there hunting an endangered species, folks. And that's what the problem I have with this. I'm not against hunting. Not at all. Except. No, not at all except. You know, I'm... For most species, not at all. Not deer, certainly not deer. And I'm not, a, I'm not opposed to, uh, you know, birds. No, not at all. But an endangered species. There's a reason in America we have an Endangered Species Act to protect endangered species like the wolf, which now has actually been reintroduced to hunting. Um, the bald eagle. We can't go out and hunt eagles. We can't even hold a feather of a bald eagle in our possession, unless certain stringent rules apply. Mainly, you happen to be part of a Native American, American Indian tribe and have a vested reason for a ceremony. That's pretty much it. And I have looked at that law, and that's it, folks. You can't go out and just indiscriminately hunt bald eagles. Nope. But you can't do that with elephants either. But yet, Ian Gibson was able to. So 
There is no sympathy that most people, as I've read in comments earlier, uh, offer Mr. Gibson. Uh, he probably was a fine man. He was probably a great guy. A uh, guy I'd probably sit and have a beer with. He'd probably tell me all these stories about his trips to Africa. And I would just sit there listening to him with delight. That's probably the kind of guy he is. But when you're out there trying to kill elephants, when there's already a problem with poaching, poachers, they're now slaughtering up to 35,000 of the estimated 500,000 African elephants each year for their tusks. A single male elephant's two tusks can weigh more than 250 pounds, with a pound of ivory fetching as much as 1,500 on the black market. The ivory is so valuable because all across Asia, particularly in China, ivory figurines are given as gifts, and China regards ivory as a cultural heritage, and they're not going to ban it. But now, get this, many Chinese consumers... They don't realize that elephants must be killed for their ivory. In one survey, more than two-thirds of Chinese respondents said that they thought tusks grew back like fingernails. They don't. Let's take a look at the next video. Our top story this half hour, the latest efforts to save thousands of elephants in Africa. On Tuesday, the White House announced new restrictions aimed at ending an illegal global ivory trade that brings in profits of up to $10 billion per year. Here's Charlie Daggett. Last week, 130 Kenyan wildlife officials took part in a census to count what remains of the region's elephant population. It's an exercise that we carry out every three years with the main purpose of understanding uh, how many elephants and other wildlife we have in this sub ecosystem. Not even elephants in this sanctuary have been immune to the systematic poaching that occurs across the African continent. Even poachers who are killed are readily replaced. There's an endless supply of people who are willing to take those risks. The hunt is for the elephant's ivory tusks, known as white gold. The illegal global trade brings in an estimated profits of eight to ten billion dollars a year. This is what $8 million of ivory looks like. Nearly four tons were recently seized by authorities in Togo before it could be smuggled out of the country to Vietnam. In November, the U.S. government grinded a similar six-ton stockpile into dust. It was a symbolic gesture to encourage other nations to destroy the contraband. This week, the Obama administration announced new restrictions that close loopholes and end commercial trading. The global ivory trade is fueled by soaring demand in China, where it's considered a status symbol by wealthy Chinese and a rising middle class. During this 2012 investigation in Cairo, a merchant told CBS News he'd even sold to government officials. And the special aeroplane going back, really? they put the stuff on. What, you get Chinese government officials? Yeah. They bought from you? Yeah. Ivory trading has been illegal since 1989. It's believed there's only between 250,000 and 500,000 elephants left in Africa. For CBS This Morning Saturday, Charlie Daggett, London. Who are the poachers? Do you know who the poachers are? There's actually a tie to the Twin Cities with poaching of elephants in Africa. The, one of the largest groups of poachers. It comes from the criminal syndicates, terrorist organizations. One group in particular is on the U.S. terror watch list. That's El Shabaab, based out of Somalia. Uh, they're essentially the Somalia wing of Al Qaeda, or probably now ISIS or ISIL, however you want to pronounce the Islamic State. Uh, Uganda's Lord's Resistance Army, a rebel group notorious for enslaving children, also raises money through poaching. Do you know how much Al Shabaab raises monthly from poaching? $600,000 in American dollars worth of ivory is poached. That's a lot. A lot going to criminal activities. And here, I think, is the biggest problem we have with the current way of doing things. It goes back to the law of supply and demand. The more ivory that we take off the market, 
the higher the price goes, the more lucrative the trade goes. We know that China's not going to uh, outright ban ivory. They're not going to. So the more we do these symbolic gestures like grinding up ivory, the more money we're giving to El Shabaab. That becomes a problem. China also uses elephant tusks, ivory, as an herbal medicine. So are we going to go and tell the Chinese that, we can't, that they have to change their herbal medicine re uh, recipe? I think not. So if you look at the law of supply and demand, what's the alternative? The alternative is to actually increase the supply and trade of ivory. And here's why. What will happen is two things. One, people will have a vested interest in protecting the precious commodities of ivory because there's a, a profit motive. And then two is the fact that by, it'll also reduce the price. Now, yes, you can also argue that the uh, lower price will increase demand, yes, in China, but it will also get it more out of the hands of El Shabaab and ISIL, ISIS, and other terrorist organizations by having a regulated trade. Have trade agreements. Can we go back to what actually works in basic economics? Trade agreements on the trade of ivory. I think we can make it regulated, and that might be a much better solution. John Stossel also agrees with me, and you've probably seen Stossel on ABC. You may have seen him on Fox News. Stossel agrees with me on this. And so we're going to take a look at one of his clips about endangered animals. In Africa, rhinos were disappearing. Poachers killed them for their horns. African governments banned poaching, but this did little good. We're talking about countries, governments, and police forces that are often involved in the poaching. Some government game wardens took bribes or slept on the job. It was a complete failure. Um, wildlife was disappearing everywhere. Species were disappearing from large areas. Brian Child spent years in Africa trying to save the rhino. What finally worked, he said, was letting landowners own them and make money off tourism. Suddenly, each tribe had skin in the game, an incentive to protect its own rhinos. Those indifferent security guards became fierce protectors of their tribal rhinos. Terry Anderson asked one, What happens if you catch a poacher? Do you kill him? He said, No, we don't kill them. We just beat them up badly enough. They go back to their village and don't ever come back. These people don't tolerate poaching because they want to keep the animals alive. They allow hunting, they allow photography. That is the way to save wildlife. And it's worked. There's a lot more rhinos on, alive on private land where there were no rhinos 50 years ago, 40 years ago. Well, with um, elephants, I did find out while that last clip was playing that Asian elephants are even more endangered than African elephants. Uh, the threat there isn't so much poaching as it is human encroachment. Uh, there are only about 30,000 remaining wild Asian elephants, while 1,500 of them live in captivity. Uh, now, if 1,500 15, 15, of 30,000 remaining wild Asian elephants live in captivity, Fifth, half of the population. Now, I'd like to know when the Animal Humane Society representative that we heard earlier in the show, when he's going to speak out about these 15,000 elephants living in captivity. Should, by his logic, they not be out there living in the wild, not cooped up in, in, in captivity? I mean, we can't have captive elephants, but what's going to happen as soon as those 15,000 currently in captivity are brought out into the wild? We'll probably have about 15,000 left. But right now, we know that even those 15,000 in captivity, at least they're alive. Now, Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey Circus is getting rid of the elephants, a staple they've had since 1882. American-human interaction with elephants is going to be reduced even further. And the animal rights activists are going to have the smug look of justification that they did a job well done when there's a lot of good that can be that can be done through circuses and zoos. 
But the elephants, they're thick skinned. But are they going to, are they thick enough skinned to deal with bad policy? Bad policy from the animal rights activists, bad policy from governments that want to ban the ivory trade instead of opening it up by making sure that there's a protected nature of the elephant herds. What happens right now when an elephant dies, even in a zoo? What happens with that ivory tusk that may weigh 250 pounds? What happens to it is it gets burned. They burn the elephant's ivory tusk. That's it. It's gone. But eventually we're going to be having a day of current policy continues, a day without elephants. And that's not what we want to see. And that's why I'm spending almost a whole hour's show for our pretty much our second show uh, talking about elephants because of the ivory trade, because of bad policy, because we're not going to be seeing them on our continent if the animal rights activists have their way. Go to a zoo. Find an elephant in a zoo. Well, right now you still can. But after the circuses are, are done, then it's going to be the zoos that are next. Pretty soon you will not find, even in captivity, an elephant on the uh, North American continent. I can guarantee you now, probably within 50 years, you will not see a single elephant if all the animal rights activists get their way. That's what this program today is about. Because there is another way to turn this around. And I'm not just talking about having more circuses. You know, if first of all, what's going to happen if we don't have any more elephants and circuses and zoos? You know what's going to happen? Complacency. We're going to have a, po a point where elephants are the only things you read about in books. You can go online and read about the Second Punic War and these elephants crossing the Alps, but will people in future generations be able to make that connection of what an, an, an elephant actually is like? Oh, sure, yes. You know, my intern Andrew is saying, well, just go to YouTube. Hello, yes. Who knows what YouTube is going to look like in 20 years. But my point being is that people need that exposure to elephants, to appreciate them, to bond with them. And then maybe if an animal rights organization can cut the right deal, which I know they could if they wanted to, actually work on getting folks like me to donate money to their cause of protecting elephants in the wild. Work on opening up the ivory trade. Do what we can for species survival. Here's another John Stosser clip because I really believe that, uh, and he's speaking with Brian Yablonski of the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. And I really believe what Stossel and Yablonski have to say makes a ton of sense. Let's go to the video. In Texas, ranchers conserve to make money. That's right. That's right. So in Texas, we have a case of hunters and ranchers that are actually saving animals that are already on the endangered species list. And there are hundreds of ranches in Texas that for years had been raising cattle, and they made a business decision to switch to raising wildlife. And they want to raise wildlife, wildlife for hunting. Wildlife like antelope. Exactly. Some native to America, but some native to Africa, Asia, and Europe. Animals that are disappearing in Africa, Asia, and Europe. Three animals in particular. There are three African antelope, the scimitar horned oryx, the addicts, and the dama gazelle that are either extinct or nearly extinct in Africa. But guess where they're flourishing? Texas? Deep in the heart of Texas. They're flourishing because hunters are willing to pay $5,000 to $10,000 a piece to come and hunt the antelope in Texas. So ranchers and landowners there have every incentive to husband those species, to grow those species, to breed those species. So now we have a nearly extinct species being brought back. I would think the federal government would be thrilled by this. Well, in order to hunt a, an animal that is on the endangered species list, you do have to get an exclusion from the federal government. And initially, the federal government granted that exclusion because it did recognize the conservation value. You know, these, these ranchers started with a few dozen antelope you know, back in the 1970s. Today, they've got 17,000 antelope on their ranches. I mean, it's pretty effective. But guess what? Animal rights groups didn't agree. They sued, as usual. They sued. They went to court. Uh, it's been in court for a number of years. And, and as of last week, all the court remedies have really been exhausted. And now these hunters and ranchers are going to have to go to the federal government to get a special take permit 
if they want to continue these hunts. And these take permits are not necessarily the easiest things to get. They're pretty cumbersome. And What's going to happen? Well, you know, some of the ranchers in Texas believe that in five years, the numbers of antelope will decline by 50 percent. And within 10 years, uh, there may only be a few hundred left, if any at all. So when the politicians say, yes, we can save the animals, <laughs> I say this, you would agree. I would agree. There's two courses of action to take. You can nurture and protect the species, as John Stossel and uh, Brian Yablonski advocate, or there's isolation and deprivation. And that's what the animal rights organizations, PETA, uh, the Animal Humane Society, that's what they advocate. Now I want to separate for just a second the Animal Humane Society as opposed to you know, the Humane Society of Minnesota. The Animal Humane Society is a nationwide large nonprofit organization that is very much in line with the goals of PETA and other protectionists. Your local humane society is a group that you should support, especially if you care about uh, cats and dogs and you want to adopt and keep them from dying. Or there's still yet another alternative and that's going to a no-kill shelter. But I want to make sure my comments about the humane society are not taken the wrong way. I don't want them out of context. My comment is specifically the animal humane society, the big, large uh, circus tent of an organization is the one that's in the wrong, not your local Humane Society chapter. Uh, so what is the answer? The answer really should be opening up the ivory trade, working with uh, the different countries, especially China and the African countries, to make sure that you know, we have a regulated trade on ivory, that we, you know, we take the trade barriers on ivory down. Let's reduce the price. Then we also need to really go and, and take our bomb sniffing um, elephants from South Africa and we need to take them into places where we have Al-Shabaab and you know we can really do some good on, on multi -front, multi, multiple fronts if we're going after ISIS and Al-Shabaab uh, with elephants. Let's raise a herd of elephants. And let's go and let's, you know, have some karmatic action here against those peewits that are killing the elephants. I think the world would be much better for it. Um, yes, this is my ranting and uh, raving here, but in a serious policy discussion, I really do believe that... Um, <laughs> my producer says, now that's karma. Um, but in all seriousness, you know, we need to, we need to look at elephants as a commodity. Let's profitize them. Uh, you know, you know let's, let's monetize the elephants. And yes, you know, there has to be some type of regulations on how you can take an, an elephant. You know, what age, I mean, and, I'm, and I'm not a uh, you know, zoologist, I don't have a background uh, in elephant uh, life cycles, but um, you know, uh, have a certain number of mature elephants that are protected, have a certain number of mid-range that are available for the taking, and then of course naturally when, when they, uh, the elephants die, then you can harvest their tusks, sell them on the open market. There's a lot that can be done, but right now everything is completely backwards. So now that I've really talked a lot for this last hour, which I know you're not used to after I played the last few weeks these videos, uh, I'm getting my voice back again. Um, we're going to have another exciting show next week. So with that, we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.